Sports Beat is brought to you by Ken Gart. We hear you. Sports Beat is live. JJ and Sam with you for the next 45 minutes. Live sports continues to return. Major League Baseball highlights on the show tonight. NFL News and Tony Finau in contention at the Memorial on the PGA Tour. As the college football season continues to work through several twists and turns, BYU's schedule may have just received a huge addition with a national power, Alabama. That and a related top five list that you don't want to miss. But tonight, we're going to start off by... Uh, in the NBA with the latest from the Utah Jazz down in Orlando. Not that we're counting or anything, but I did just check off one more day on the calendar. In four nights from now, the Jazz will be playing its first of three exhibition games. And in 11 more days, the official restart to the season against the Pelicans. We know the Jazz, they'll have a different look to what they do offensively this season. Boyan Bogdanovich won't be there. He had the team's highest offensive rating this season. We know what kind of an impact he has on the outside game. But he also led the team in fast break possessions. His absence, it will not be slowing the Jazz down any, though. They'll still push the tempo and shoot plenty of threes. I, I wouldn't have known that state about Boyan, but um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we try to, I guess, play that way in, in practice a bit to, to get up and, and push the ball. And um, obviously, with the, the kind of the four guy, the guards that we're, we're going to have out there majority of the time with Rudy or Tony or whoever. Um, everyone can handle, everyone can push, everyone can rebound the ball. So um, point guards to, to kind of quote unquote four men. Um, we've got a pretty versatile group in, in those, those guard spots. So um, yeah, I think, I think for us pushing the ball and, and shooting early threes, good, good threes, but early threes can be something that we can um, be really effective in. Cause like I said, with the, that lineup, those lineups, we've got pretty, uh, pretty consistent shooters kind of throughout now, it's obvious that the Utah Jazz will need Donovan Mitchell to play like an all-star in order to have success in Orlando. There isn't any reason why he shouldn't. So strong in so many areas of his game, but there's one area where Donovan has placed emphasis on getting better. Becoming a better passer. I think that's our more willing passer. I think getting into the lane, you know, obviously, you know, get there, you know, and um, take certain shots, whatever. But I think being able to find my teammate, especially with with Boyan being out, we're going to need guys to kind of pick it up and, and kind of pick up the slack that he had. So for us, it's like for me, you know, obviously uh, take the shots that I can get, but also being able to find my teammates, getting them easier looks, which will then also come back and make it easier myself. But being able to do that, I think, will not just help me for where we are now, but help me for years upon my career. But Donovan Mitchell is only 23 years old, competing, completing his third NBA season, but it's clear the Jazz look to Donovan as a team leader and need him to play like one in Orlando. Becoming a leader is something that has developed over time, but during the pandemic and now in Orlando, teammates have made comments about the increased leadership and maturity of Donovan Mitchell. A leadership role is something he embraces as he tries to reach his potential as an NBA star and lead the Jazz to wins. Uh, I think the biggest thing for me is not running, not allowing, you know, the name I've created on the floor and off the floor to kind of affect the work that I've been doing, you know, continuing to, to work on my game and get better as a teammate, better as a leader, better as a player uh, in so many different ways. I think that's really where it starts because, you know, it's easy to kind of get what I've been able to be given at an early age and early in your career and kind of just, you know, chill, you know, and I think that's the, that's the I try to do the exact opposite uh, and just kind of just focus and, and focus on myself in the game and let everything else kind of flow the way it has been. I've been blessed to, you know, they've been granted with opportunity as a rookie, you know, and fortunately I seized that opportunity and I've been kind of going with it ever since. But yeah, you're right. I've, I've kind of honed in as trying to be the leader of this team and going out there and just leading these guys any way I can, whether it's meals, it's it's gaming, it's on the floor, pick and roll, defense, like whatever it may be, just kind of going out there and just trying to be the voice because, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, I'm three years in, but I, I kind of see myself as a little bit more than that. Um, and I think that's really where my head is at, you know, not really thinking about, wow, you know, I've been able to get all this. I appreciate it and I'm blessed, but, you know, um, the team that we're playing doesn't really care about that. They, honestly, it's about going out there and getting wins and, and being the best player and being the best teammate I can be. From the Utah Jazz, the Stifle Tower, Rudy Gobert. Runs inside, pick and roll, Rudy Hammer. Run by Rudy. Nine. 
And here's Rudy. Rudy swats it away. Rudy gets turned around. DeLon right back. Oh, my. Where did he come from? Since the NBA Defensive Player of the Year award was introduced in 1983, just one player has won the award in three consecutive seasons. That was Dwight Howard from 2009 to 2011 with the Orlando Magic. Eight other players in the history of the award have won it in back-to-back -back years, which of course includes Rudy Gobert. The NBA announced this week that games played down in Orlando will not be factored into NBA awards consideration. So, did Rudy Gobert do enough before the pandemic to earn a third straight Defensive Player of the Year award? Well, his teammate Joe Ingles thinks so. Do I think he's the best defender in the league? Absolutely. Uh, I think he protects the rim. Um, he obviously plays pick, uh, the, the pick and roll defense we want. He can be up, he can be back. I don't know what the numbers say, but, but in my, my mind, he's, he's one of the best rim protectors too. So I would hope that he's either going to win it. Um, I'm sure for himself, he wants to, to, to win it for that recognition. But um, regardless, if he doesn't, we, we know what, what we think of him and, and how much he, he means to our team. Hey Ben Joe, uh, he's a trooper. He's going, he's going through a, a, a lot. He's had a lot of stuff going on, but you know he's a fighter. Well, you created a trend on Twitter and through Jazz Nation. That's now Head Ben Joe. That's what I've been striving for my whole life. <laughs> Head Ben, it's coming. It's a thing. Fan stores, watch out. Yes, the legend of Head Ben Joe began on November 12th, 2018, when an injured Joe Ingles received four stitches, wrapped his head with gauze and rallied the Jazz to a road win over the Grizzlies. Well, Joe has been spotted wearing a headband again, this time in Orlando. In fact, he did today's media availability wearing one, as you saw. Will we get to see it in a game in the bubble? My hair's been so luxurious and long that I was just trying to keep it out of my eyes today. Um, no, it actually started, well, it obviously started that Memphis thing or whatever, but then one day in the facility, I was wearing it just to be funny because Mike had his on and I thought me and Mike were shooting on the same day and I wore it and I shot really well and then Dennis Lindsay actually was standing in his um, thing that overlooks the, the practice facility and started yelling stuff at me and how bad it looked so I was like well I'm just going to keep wearing it and if Dennis hates it that much so um, the chance I, I play in this thing like actually it's like the first time I've actually been able to see myself um, the chance I play in it is very small but if I play with it in a scrimmage and I play a good game, I can promise you it's here. <laughs> it'll be here to stay. Just wear it, Joe. Hey, with all the time off, you think the Jazz have fresh legs for the restart? Well, Donovan Mitchell certainly has a bounce in his step in Orlando. Showing off a bit after practice today. Off the glass, catching it way down by the hip and throwing it down. Now, not to be outdone, Emmanuel Moutier tossing one up and then one touch off the thigh, dunking it with both hands. Tell you what, the bubble dunk contest is officially underway. All right, now to the PGA Tour. Golf is a cruel game. Tony Finau was reminded of that this weekend. He left the 11th hole Saturday at the Memorial at 1,200 with a four-shot lead. By the end of the third round, he was down four shots, and that spiral continued Sunday. Rough weather at Muirfield Village. The final delayed by thunderstorms this morning. It was a rough front nine for Tony. Continuing his struggles from the back nine, Saturday overshoots the green on six. He triple bogey, the hole falling out of contention. He would bounce back on the back nine, though. This for birdie on 10. I'd love to see what he then he would birdie again on 11, but he had four bogeys, a double bogey, and a triple, dropping 10 shots in 27 holes. He still finished eighth at two under. Now, our play of the day belongs to John Rahm, who saw his eight-shot lead trimmed to three, but this shot on 16 was clutch. Chipping in for birdie, or so we thought. Replay showed the ball slightly moved before Rom struck the ball, so he was assessed as two-stroke penalty. Doesn't matter, still an awesome play. He still wins the Memorial by three strokes and gets a fist bump from a legend, Jack Nicholas. Rom is now the number one ranked player in the world. All right, now to college football. BYU's football schedule for 2020 took a beating last week when the Big Ten and Pac-12 announced they would play conference-only schedules this fall due to COVID-19. Yeah, after losing four September games, it seems Tom Homo, though, and BYU, they're getting back up off the mat, making a pretty quick recovery. 
Matt Zinnitz of AL.com, who covers Alabama football, reporting that the Crimson Tide are closing in on a new week one opponent, that opponent none other than BYU. They would replace USC on Alabama's schedule in the season opener, a game that was scheduled to be played in Arlington, Texas at AT&T Stadium. If the SEC doesn't move to conference-only schedule, and if college football actually happens this fall, BYU versus Alabama, a strong possibility, according to this report. If it happens, this would be the second meeting all time between the Cougars and Crimson Tide. The first and only meeting took place in Tuscaloosa on September 5th, 1998. Alabama was powered by their star running back, Sean Alexander. The future Seahawk rushed for 115 yards and five touchdowns. After falling behind 24-7, the Cougars would rally and tie it. Kevin Federick connected with Tavita Ofahangawe for a 10-yard touchdown before halftime. Then Reno Mahe would score from six yards out in the third quarter. And Owen Potsman field goal tied the game at 24. But the future NFL star running back was just too much for the Cougars defense. He scored twice in the fourth quarter, including this run. BYU lost 38-31. Rob Morris was outstanding on defense, 13 tackles, 10 solo, and two sacks. All right, up next, a basketball card sells for $1.8 million. Not a joke, not a typo. We'll show you why. Yeah, and more from the Utah Jazz in Orlando. That one's driven deep to left field. Going back, Smith, track, wall, see ya. All rise, although no one was there to rise. Aaron Judge is back, and so is Major League Baseball. Highlights as teams tune up for this week's season opener. I never knew that he had any personal feelings um, for me the way that he showed in the last band. Plus, a conversation with Thurl Bailey and Isaiah Thomas. What did Isaiah think of the way the Pistons were depicted in the Last Dance documentary, as well as his rivalry with Michael Jordan and the Bulls? Well, you'll hear him respond to that coming up next. Back to the Jazz, the Orlando experience is going to be different for all 22 NBA teams that are there, including the Utah Jazz. There'll be no such thing as a home court advantage. Yeah, that's always been a big advantage for the Jazz, too. There were two things that the Jazz have always been able to count on. Yeah, we know playing home games, that playing at elevation helps them, and also playing in front of some of the loudest, if not the loudest, fans in the NBA. But neither of those things will be an advantage on the neutral court in Orlando. Playing without fans is going to be an adjustment, but Donovan says it won't change the way the best players in the world are going to play the game of basketball. You're really just going to see what guys talk about in open gym. And honestly, everybody's so worried about the trash talking. There's a lot of, like, just jokes being made on the floor. And obviously, with come playoff time, that kind of goes out the window. But um, it's going to be weird at first. But at the end of the day, we've all played pickup in empty gyms. And I feel like that's what it's going to feel like as far as talking to each other. But uh, there'll be some things that... It'll, that'll pick up and definitely allow for, you know, you guys to kind of run with and, and have fun with because it's just the nature of the game. But um, I don't think it'll be any different at all. Well, we've heard several Jazz players address what they need to do to overcome the absence of Boyan Bogdanovich. George Yang is one of those players the team will need to lean on a bit more through this process. But he hasn't been a full participant in practices since the team arrived in Orlando. So why is that? Well, George, he answers that question for us just rolled my ankle, um, you know, so we were just taking precautionary steps. I mean, we don't play for another uh, 14 days, I think it is. So just taking it slow, getting in there to get uh, to full speed. Coach also said I was kicking too much <laughs> So had to, to take it easy. It's not even fair when George is out there. <laughs> Everything LeBron James turns to gold. Even this basketball card, this 0304. Autographed rookie card from Upper Deck that features a piece of game-worn jersey sold this weekend for more than $1.8 million. It is one of just 23 of these cards ever produced. This is the highest graded of them all. The first million-dollar card of the modern era. Wow. Well, the MLS's back tournament continued today. In Group F, the Chicago Fire taking on San Jose Earthquake. Scoreless until the second half, 56th minute. Christian Espinoza rips it with the left boot. It's a 1-0 lead. Then in the 83rd minute, Chris Wondolowski in his 17th season. The header. San Jose wins 2-0. They win Group F, and they'll advance to the knockout round. The Sounders look like MLS champs again after a loss in time. Their first two games in Group B, they crush the Whitecaps tonight. 34th minute, 
Jordan Morris finishes to give the Sounders a 2-0 lead. Second half, they would add a third goal off the corner kick. Raul Rui Diaz finishes. Real Salt Lake, by the way, back in action Wednesday against rival Sporting KC, looking for a spot in the knockout stage. All right, back to college football. If BYU and Alabama happens in week one, it would be another rare opportunity for the Cougars to play an SEC team. They've only played 14 games against current members of the SEC. They're 7-7 seven seven in those games. Yeah, so we thought, why not revisit some of that history with this week's top five? BYU's five best wins all time against current SEC teams. Number five came just last season. BYU's first ever visit to Neyland Stadium in Knoxville saw the Cougs make a late comeback to tie the game up and go to OT. And then that big push at the line for the game winner by Tyson Williams. And BYU's perfect season is intact. BYU went to Starkville in 2001, ranked seventh in the nation. The Cougars rallied from a 21-7 deficit to beat the Bulldogs and moved to 12-0. Brandon Doman threw five touchdown passes. Reno Mahe caught 10 passes for 189 yards and two touchdowns. Doug Jolly caught 10 passes for 177 yards, but the Cougars needed that field goal to win. Luke Staley broke his leg on the final drive, but he set up Matt Payne's 25-yard game winner. So throwing the rainbow. K.O. makes a catch, breaks the tackle at the 30, at the 20. Goodbye, K.O. touchdown. The 14-1 1996 season got started off in Provo against Texas A&M in the Pigskin Classic. Steve Sarkeesian had a monster game completing 33 of 44 pass attempts, 536 yards and six touchdowns. His final touchdown to K.O. Kealaluli with 103 left on the clock was the game winner. The Cougs finished that season ranked fifth in the nation. Back to throw as Wilson throws, touchdown! Just days after suffering a burst appendix, Mark Wilson led BYU to an 18-17 comeback win over 14th-ranked Texas A&M. With one minute left in the game, he connected with Clay Brown for a three-yard touchdown to get BYU within one. Then Lavelle Edwards decides to gamble, go for two in the win. Wilson finds Mike Lacey in the end zone for the two-point conversion. They rally from a 14-3 deficit in the second half to beat the Aggies in Houston. The first BYU win over a top-20 non-conference opponent. Throws it back to Young. Young touches the ball. They might. They do score. One of the most iconic plays in BYU history and in Steve Young's career at BYU with 30 seconds left. Young pitches the ball to running back Eddie Stinnett, who passes it back to Young for the 14-yard touchdown. It was the game-winning play and a 21-17 win over Missouri in the 1983 Holiday Bowl. The Cougs overcame five turnovers. Young rushed for a TD, passed for a TD, and caught the touchdown. The Cougs won the final 11 games that season to finish 11-1 and 7th in the national rankings. Detroit Pistons Hall of Fame point guard Isaiah Thomas is Thurl Bailey's guest this week on Thurl Talk. Isaiah's reaction to how he was portrayed in the Last Dance documentary is next. NBA teams are allowed to have 17 players on the roster down in Orlando. With the absence of Boyan Bogdanovich, the Jazz have 16. That includes six players that did not have NBA experience prior to this season. Now, those players are Juwan Morgan, Mie Oni, Ray John Tucker, Nigel Williams-Goss, Justin Wright Foreman, and Jarrell Brantley. Those six guys combined just averaged 30, three minutes played per game over a combined 50 games this season. Not much experience there, but what they've been adding to the team while in Orlando so far has not gone unnoticed. And it's tough, you know, you come into a position where, you know, throughout the majority of the year you don't play much and then you get down here and you never know what, when your opportunity may come. Um, so I think it's tough to kind of keep and stay locked in, but they've done a great job of that. They're very professional, they've been giving 200% every time they, they get on the court and, uh, and they're pushing us, uh, the little older guys, uh, to be a... Uh, you know, to, to, to get better every day. The Last Dance documentary featuring Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls dynasty of the 90s was must-see TV during the pandemic. The rivalry between Jordan's Bulls and Isaiah Thomas's Detroit Pistons was a central focus in the early episodes. Well, this week's Thurl Talk podcast with Utah Jazz great Thurl Bailey, he has a conversation with Thomas about that rivalry and how it was portrayed in the documentary series. I never had a chance to 
<coughs> excuse me, to really peek behind the curtain in terms of what the Chicago Bulls interworkings were like right. from a team standpoint. You always you always play against the opponent when they come out of the locker room, but you never really know what's going on inside the locker room. Okay. Being able to see him in the Chicago Bulls from that vantage point gave me a a, a totally different look. Uh, from a competition standpoint of the people that we were competing against. I was surprised to see the, the they had so much dysfunction in-house. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really shocked at the relationship that they all personally had with Jerry Krause. As a team, you always thought that they were so well-connected. Mm-hmm. But... Then when you hear the interviews and everything else, you see that there was a lot of disconnect. I was I was shocked um, to to hear his personal feelings um, that he had towards me because I, you know, I, I never I never knew that. Right. Um, I just thought that again it was the the, the Pistons uh, against the Bulls and and. Um, you know, at, at that time, uh, you know, I looked at I looked at Magic and Bird. Those were the two people that I was chasing in terms of trying to win championships. Uh, at that particular time, um, you know, we we were we were beating Chicago uh, pretty pretty soundly. <laughs> um, and and, then, and I'm I'm not trying to I'm not trying to downplay it or anything, but it did make me go back and look at. You know, our head-to-head competition, yeah. and had, was I mistaken in terms of my recollection? And you know, head-to-head competition. Uh, you know, my record against <laughs> against uh, him, you know, was 37 and 16 <laughs> uh, up until 1991 uh, when I uh, had career-ending wrist surgery. Right. You know, we didn't socialize or anything because back then. You know, you, you played the game and, and you went home. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, uh, so I never really got to know him. So I I was really surprised, um, you know, to to hear uh, the way he felt about me personally because I've never really interacted with him in the times that I have interacted with him. Even after we were done playing, was always cordial, yeah. um, you know, was always uh, professional. And, you know, like any of us uh, who are former players, when we see each other, we, we give each other respect and love. And, right. and and then you keep moving. So I never knew that he had any personal feelings um, for me the way that he showed in the last dance. You can hear that entire conversation on kslsports.com. Up next, Tom Hackett heads to the links with Utah football insider Steve Bartle. The Hallowed Grounds, brought to you by Siegfried and Jensen. Welcome into the beautiful Ogden Golf and Country Club. The Hallowed Grounds, Mr. Steve Bartle introducing. Uh, Steve, uh, by the way, managing editor at Ute Zone. If you're a Utah fan and you do not know what UteZone.com is, you are a fool. Go check it out, UteZone.com. The managing, the managing editor himself, Mr. Steve Bartle. Quickly, this is how this game works, okay? We're going to play this hole right here. We're on the fourth par four. If you beat me, we'll go to the next hole. If you hit it closest to the pin on the next hole, this Bushnell wingman, courtesy of Bushnell, is Ooh. all yours. Ooh, all Mr. right. Mr. Bartle, it's a speaker GPS system. If not, our good friends up at Heber Valley Golf. We'll get you sorted one way or another. You ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. T-Box is all yours, my friend. Wow. Oh. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. That's part of the problem. I'm getting so yoked, I can't play <laughs> golf anymore. Hey, uh, what do you attribute the uh, Utah football recruiting success to, Steve? You know, uh, I remember... I think the big thing with Utah recruiting, I think it all comes down to the relationships that the coaches establish with their players. Okay. I think that above all else is is why Utah has had such success in recent years recruiting and, and that. 
you know, the big victory last year was Clark Phillips. Right. And Sharif Shaw created a, a significant bond with Clark and his family and that. And that was a big reason why they were able to flip him from the Ohio State University. Go. Go. Ah, that's all right. I got two questions for you and I need quick answers to them. Okay, quick answers coming. Utah football will win their first Pac-12 championship in? 2021. I'll go 2021. The next head coach after Kyle Whittingham will be? Whoa! Uh, uh, man, ooh, I'm gonna stick with Morgan Scally still. I think he, uh, I think he rebounds from all of this. I think he recovers. I think, you know, he, he makes right the wrongs that he did. And uh, I think he's still the guy. Really? I really do. I really do. And I know that's hard to say right now. Oh. Holy what a shot. Hey, it would be rude for me not to uh, give a plug to our podcast. It's Utah's World. It's, oh, a, pretty, it's a pretty good podcast, if I don't it's, say so. It's, it's mildly decent, you know. Roll. Here's the deal. You make that putt, you win. Oh, don't say that, man. I didn't hit it enough. Oh, no. Yes, did you see what I did? Oh, no. You hey, said I'll, they I'll were give you fast. That. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Oh, boy. Oh, uh, it's good stuff. Oh, man. What a. of putts that don't make the hole don't go in. That's embarrassing. Did you? I mean, I left it, you know. A foot short. A foot short. That's embarrassing. Yeah, that's good stuff I'm right hurting. there. I'm hurting right now. I'm hurting. Hey, you know what? That's good television. And uh, Mr. Steve Bartle. Yeah. Thank you so much thank for you, joining Tom. us. From, for, you know, from a distance. Thank you. Socially distant. Yes. Uh, is there anything you would like to tell the people before we get out of here? Mask up. Mask up. Uh, and You've run out up. of time. Thank you so much for having <laughs> us. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Okay, this week's pro tip of the week, we've got Bob Wallace from uh, the Ogden Golf and Country Club, head pro up here, he's the big dog on campus. We're going to work on, um, on, on the hands and the arms, well more so the arms and the body working together, right? Correct, correct. It's a good, a good little drill, a good little tip for people to use. A lot of people call these tees. These are cheap training aids, something that you can use to help groove your swing. What we're going to have Tom do is we're going to have him put one of these under each armpit. Okay. And what he's going to do is he's going to swing and try to keep these underneath his arms. The idea of this is to keep your arms and your body connected. This will allow him to turn his body back and through. So this, this groove, isn't the swing. This isn't going to feel natural. No. Okay, no, good. Should not feel. Okay. All right. Good. You'll see, you'll notice good turn through the shot. Good contact, something that you can do that's easy, that's cheap, help you groove that swing. And I think it's pretty self-explanatory, right? If you put the tees under your armpits and you make the swing and one of the tees or both of the tees fall out, it just tells you that uh, you're not as compact as you probably yep. need, to need to be. You need to stay more connected, as they would say. Bob, you're the man. Thanks for having us. That's your pro tip of the week. Hi, I'm Maddie. I work at Uinta Golf and I'm one of the shoe experts here. We're going to kind of go over basically what we have here in our store. We have great options for everybody, every type of golfer, every level of experience. We definitely have a wide range of options for our customers and it makes it really helpful because then you can always find the perfect shoe for you. Golf for days in Heber Valley at one of five beautiful mountain courses. Wasatch Golf Course, Soldier Hollow Golf Course, and the Homestead Golf Club are all within seven miles of each other. Enjoy the feeling of getting away without the long drive.